Ken is known to uh, almost everybody here. He's he came to us with a doctorate from the Ed School, and he's now postdoctoral fellow in the group. Um, but when he was still a graduate student, he worked with Matt Schnipps on some on uh, reading and dyslexia. So he's been he's been in the group for quite a long time, um, and he's been an extremely productive um, uh, postdoc. Uh, one of the interesting things is that he wrote his doctoral dissertation was not on a typical STEM topic. It was called Romantic Transfer from Science to Social Ideologies. And it was about how kids take scientific principles and sort of misapply them to all kinds of social situations like the conservation laws, conservation of mass and, and energy turn into conservation of luck and things like that. So it's, it was a very interesting dissertation. But he's, he's got a pretty unique take uh, working on this book, uh, Newton in the Pandemic, a science picture book project. Because 355 years ago, in 1666, which is an easy number to remember, Newton was only 23. So he's younger than all of us here. And the, the plague sent him home from the university to his home uh, in the countryside, which he generally hated. Um, and in that year, year and a half, he made three revolutionary uh, discoveries. One was he developed the integral calculus um, uh, and uh, he refined his uh, gravitational theory. So he was able to satisfy himself that the gravity that holds that that makes apples fall that holds us to the earth is the same gravity that holds the moon in orbit and the third thing was he 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 did experiments um and experimentally verified the the nature of light um now in one reason chen might be interested in this was that he he audited my class um my chen ed class on great experiments in which the students redid their Newton's experiments. And uh, uh, most people don't realize because uh, Newton's book Optics uh, was such a tour de force was that his uh, optical experiments were really his first publication. So his first letter to the Royal Society was about his prism experiments. And in this letter, you see the early Newton, which is actually, who is actually a human being unlike the later <laughs> Newton, who was no one could possibly describe as a human being anymore. So um, uh, uh, he, he, and there's a quote that I like from his early article um, where he sets up his prism and starts looking at it. And he, he writes, it was at first a very pleasing entertainment to see the vivid, vivid and intense colors produced by this procedure. And, um, uh, so he was, he writes about his emotions, his feelings in this uh, first um, uh, article, never to be seen again. He was, he was described, you know, alternately as, as the man, the man with, with no friends or the most disagreeable man in the world. <laughs> so he was, he was not a pleasant person to be around supposedly, but um uh, Chen's gonna gonna talk about this miracle year of Newton, and uh, I just wanted to say that Chen has just had his own miracle year because during the pandemic, <laughs> during the pandemic in 2020, uh, he uh, produced 12 papers um, that, by my count, um, uh, in in a single year that have been published, and so. That's more than I have ever done. It's more than most people have ever done. And it's a real distinction that he has been so productive in so many different areas, uh, including um, learning computer science, STEM career choice, uh, teacher role models in, 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 uh, in students' lives, uh, MOOCs and um, evaluation of MOOCs. So um, I think there's probably a little bit of affinity between um, Newton, between Chen and Newton. Although I have to say, Chen is a much more agreeable person. <laughs> so take it away, Chen. <laughs> oh, thank you.
thank you so much Phil, for your introduction. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, oh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm uh, really excited to uh, talk about this uh, little book that I'm developing. And, uh, but first of all, I want to say uh, thank you all for your support uh, throughout the year for our science education uh, seminar series. As the chair of the series, I am really happy to see the huge turnout uh, every month. And uh, in the past one year, we had many uh, influential and exciting speakers from all over, all over the country. Uh, uh, usually only invite people within Harvard campus or within the greater Boston area. But with the pandemic, we tried to make a bad situation, uh, uh, turn a bad situation to, uh, to, to, to our advantage. So we decided, oh, since everything is going online, uh, we could invite people to give talks uh, uh, from all over the country, even potentially internationally, but there is always a time difference. So we didn't of that approach, but uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, very satisfied with uh, with uh, uh, I'm very happy with uh, uh, this uh, year's uh, 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 science education seminar, and we had a lot of interesting discussion. I hope that we will continue to have uh, uh, more interesting discussion in the next year. Um, so okay, well, speaking of the pandemic. And speaking how to turn a not ideal situation or an, uh, an, a, a difficult time into your own advantage and to flourish in it. Uh, I think uh, Newton is really a, a role model <laughs> or like uh, to some people is uh, like uh, a role model that gave us a lot of pressure. Uh, we will talk about uh, the memes online that are circulating at the beginning of the pandemic, where everybody is shouting, "Look at New look at what Newton did! Uh, look, look at what you are doing!" <laughs> a lot of people uh, in my postdoc cohort I feel stressed out in comparison to what Newton did more than three hundred years ago, right? So um, uh, here I want to share with you uh, my slide and start my talk. All right, can you see my slides? So Newton in the pandemic. Uh, I wrote this book. Uh, it, the book is uh, illustrated by Vivian Zhang and uh, Max Mohorn, our own Max. Uh, uh, actually this very cover um, page was, uh, draw, was illustrated by Max. It's very pretty, very artistic, but there are, it is also uh, 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 scientifically rigorous in many ways. I will let Max talk about it later. Uh, so I want to first talk about well the development of, of the idea and what I will try to achieve with this book. And then I'm going to uh, show you the book. I'm going to read this book. And then I'm going to provide the link to you all so you can download the book and read it for no, about five minutes and to, to no, so you can you know, to, to, to have a better idea of what's inside the book. And then I'm going to talk about some noteworthy details uh, and uh, explain the design be, behind some of the features, but not all of the features. Uh, and uh, in the end, I'm going to uh, just reflect upon uh, what can we teach and learn during the pandemic and about the pandemic. Uh, and I'm very eager to learn from your feedback uh, regarding to both the content and the illustration, how I can improve it. And please, please be my scientific police. <laughs> <laughs> to to check the correctness behind the behind the the science because 
it's better to get criticized within our groups rather than when it is go out into the world and uh, uh, and and embarrassed, <laughs> embarrassed. But well, I already tried to make a lot of effort. I will show you, right? So I will start. Okay. So the pandemic hit uh, early 2020, and around February 2020, way before it become a like really international uh, hazard. Uh, uh, this person, Manuela Monila, uh, from uh, uh, Colombia, I believe, uh, wrote a, a little picture book about the COVID book. This is uh, uh, one of the very first picture books about COVID-19. Um, and she published this book under Creative Commons Online uh, way before most of the Western countries uh, take this uh, uh, illness seriously. Um, but they, this was when the COVID-19 hit China the, um, the hardest. So I joined a team to adapt this uh, picture book to Chinese version and then to develop a Chinese uh, and to develop a curriculum around the COVID book. So I helped uh, kind of uh, design the curriculum around the science ideas, like how small is a virus. And we, we will start by naming all of the, the smallest thing you, 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 you know about, the smallest thing you can see. Maybe it is your hair, maybe it is a grain of salt, sand, and how can you go even, can you go smaller? Can you spray, can you spray uh, water in the air and, and, and quantify how small it is? And then we we're going to talk about, okay, uh, actually the largest virus is pretty large, uh, but, the, but most of the virus are really, really small. So, so basically uh, my responsibility in this curriculum design is to talk about the scale uh, to to small to the smallest as possible, uh, so that the hope is that if you understand how small the virus is, you'll be careful <laughs> to wear a mask, <laughs> right, and and to wear a certain uh, a kind of mask mask uh, that can filter uh, uh, the the virus, and to wash your hand frequently, right, and when I when my team tried this uh, curriculum with the uh, kindergartens. Now, maybe you find it surprising that kindergarten actually opened in China as early as the end of April and early May in 2020. <laughs> so, so they turned it. They turned this uh, pandemic around very quickly, and we test this curriculum. And what we found is that, first of all, uh, teachers were very intimidated by this science. Behind the uh, behind the virus and behind uh, the uh, public health issues, uh, because they were not trained to 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 understand this uh, subject matter concept, and uh, they are also not trained how to talk about a science concept, but that is very emotionally charged, because people have just went through a lot of tragedy tragedy moment and all they want to talk about is how dangerous the virus is and they keep talking about how a dangerous the virus is to the kid every day so you, you, you only raise a lot of anxiety rather than soothe the children which they probably need the most right uh, and uh, all of the teachers that i have interviewed what they're interested in is just make sure the kids wash their hands and understand that they should have to wash their hands a hundred times a day. All right, uh, I, I realized that uh, uh, a lot of uh, opportunity to teach about science and also social emotional skills uh, is missing, uh, even if we provided a curriculum like this. Right, and so, but this is uh, when I just started to think, oh, maybe 
a picture book can be useful to young kids, but also to adults because the teachers, a lot of the teachers don't understand the scale. <laughs> if, I, if I ask how thin is your hair, how small is a grain of salt, um, and uh, how can you, uh, what scale will you put to a driblet of the water? Most of the, most of the uh, teachers can, cannot get it correct and neither do the parents. And so that's my third uh, uh, discovery was that actually, actually uh, parents need education about this uh, pandemic, about the science behind the pandemic, behind the virus. And they can, for many parents, the only time and the only window period they can't learn something new is when they read to their kids, all right? Most of the parents are too busy or too worried about uh, the, the specific things in their lives. They, they don't learn new ideas about science and they do not address their misconceptions. But only when they have the time to sit down with their kids to read some of the very basic ideas they start to ask questions and start to address some of their uh, error uh, or misconceptions or wrong ideas, right? And maybe, maybe by teaching the young kids that they should wear a mask, we can convince their parents, <laughs> adults to wear a mask as well, right? And uh, if you remember that wearing a mask was a heatly debated uh, throughout the whole one half year, right? Uh, so, uh, so this is the, when I had this idea that I want to, if I have the opportunity, I want to create picture books that soothes the, that soothes the children, teach about social emotional skills and teach the children a little bit about science for example, washing our hands, but not really always focusing on washing our hands. And third, a book that can also teach parents so that parents will have fun reading it. And parents will, will learn something about it and it may potentially change the behavior of adult, adults, right? Okay. Um, and around March or April, when uh, the pandemic become really international, there is there is all kinds of nudist meme circling around on Twitter online. Uh, that we learn a lot about a lot about the legendary stories of Newton. That just in one in the year of the pandemic, he invented the calculus. He developed the theory of gravity. Uh, he discovered the laws of motion. He developed theory of optics and uh, hit by Apple and just turned 26. Well, what I learned is he turned 26, but Phil just said he turned 23. Well, I need to check that. But anyway, he, 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 he was said to have done a lot of things. Uh, and then I, I found it really interesting. Well, I was, uh, I was uh, 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 really impressed, right? Um, and I bring a, a biography of Newton. This is a really uh, uh, well-written biography of Newton, uh, never at rest. Well, if you are never at rest, you will be very productive during the pandemic. But uh, so during the chapter uh, for that uh, designated for 1666 pandemic in Newton's time, uh, I learned that uh, that was Newton's year of miracle, uh, known as Anni Mirabilis, right? Actually, uh, I mean, according to historical text, well, the, 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 uh, the, the only a comprehensive study that he uh, nearly finished was to develop the theory of optics, right? Uh, he had a lot of ideas about gravity uh, and about calculus and law of motion, but but he just started to initiate those ideas. But actually optics uh, and the, uh, in particular, the prison experiment is the most comprehensive 
and nearly finished a series of studies that he conducted during the year. And he was not hit by Apple, but it was, uh, it was uh, 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 told in, by stories and stories that he was hit by Apple and that time that he was hit by it uh, is supposed to be the year of pandemic uh, in, uh, at his uh, mom's place. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, in in the same spring semester of 2020, I was in I was sitting in a fields class. I was observing this class called the Great Experiment that changed our world. Right, and we had uh, uh, we spent about one or two weeks. Uh, working on or well, trying to recreate Newton's prison experiment, and this is one of the one of the settings I I I I I, uh, uh, I follow uh, I photographed uh, uh, as a part of the assignment for the course, right? So you can see that uh, on the right hand there's a there's a prison, on the left hand we can see some of the spectrum, All right? So. Uh, no. And then, well, uh, 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 when during the summer, when the pandemic is really at the climax uh, in the United States, well, all of these three pieces come together. And I, I've been thinking, well, I, I, want to, I want to talk about Newton. And I want to create a picture book that soothes the children, teach a little bit of STEM, that is inspired by real life story of Newton. And in this picture book, we can walk through to recreate the experiments and, and most importantly, the reasoning process uh, that Newton did, right? Uh, uh, but I do not want to make it a uh, historical text. And I do not want to make it a science textbook, right? So I was very sure that what I don't want the book to turn out to be and I'm, I, I'm guided by these three principles that I, I want the book to, to turn out to be. Okay, so uh, why is the Newton's book and why, why is Newton and his prism a good story? Well, what, the reason I find a good story is that it has it all for a, a dramatic structure, right? You, on, the, on the bottom, you can see this is the classic dramatic structure. And, and in Newton's book, you know, he started with a puzzle and the puzzle has been remaining puzzling for many people uh, in, uh, 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 for hundred thousand of years, right? And he went through a procedural rejection of hypothesis. So you can see a staircase of progression with his uh, reasoning and thinking and modeling. And he, he, he come across a, come very near to, come close to a breaking through when he started challenging some of his own assumptions and the assumption held by everybody else, right? And he started to make some prediction that, that could, uh, that bring him very close to the true answer, but, there is always a but. <laughs> well, he, he was near the climax, but there is a falling action uh, to test out his uh, new hypothesis. He definitely needs a second prism. Now he did all of the experiment with, with one prism in the very first couple of steps, but he definitely need a second prism to test some other predictions. And, and he was in the middle of a pandemic. He cannot get a second prison. What he can, can he do? He can only wait, right? This, the best thing he can do is wait. Well, uh, he can also invent calculus and other stuff. <laughs> but, but primarily for the, for the optics project, he just waited. And I think this really echoes what, with what most of the kids and adults were doing during the during the uh, pandemic, 
and 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 uh, and eventually, oh, everybody prevailed, and the pandemic passed, and he got his second prison. He tests his uh, hypothesis. It turns out exactly, or uh, as he expected, and and he developed his theory of uh, of refraction. Right, so this is the general theme. This is the general story of 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 the Newtons, uh, of of what Newton experienced, according to his biography. Well, all of these are is is the true event that he really had to just wait in prison for actually for more than one year, right? Uh, so what are the educational opportunities afforded by the story? Uh, uh, oops, what did I do? Uh, I, um, oh, back. Uh, there are many opportunities for, um, it, could, it should be obvious that there's a lot of science and a lot of opportunity to, to address misconceptions. And we, now our department has uh, a history of, of a publication uh, discuss about misconceptions about color, about optics, about lens, about filters, right? And I also think that this book can teach a lot about executive function that is part of the social motion skills. Uh, uh, but a lot of the time, executive function, when people talk about executive function, they talk about multiple tasking, uh, they talk about they talk about paying attention of, uh, of trying to be focused. Uh, and uh, occasionally uh, people talk about inhibition, that try not to try to con control your urge uh, 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 to be disciplined. Uh, but here, the opportunity for executive function is you no, know, just wait, right? I, 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 I don't see uh, waiting to be a, a frequently talked idea in in uh, picture books or in children's television because it's just a boring, <laughs> right? Uh, it is so undramatic. But, but well, my design about this book is wait actually is a climax of, well, or, or follow, immediate fo follows the climax of Newton's story, right? So, so I, I kind of purposefully put wait uh, to the center of the stage. And, and also uh, we can teach the children or at least discuss with the children how to spend your free time. Uh, um, I think a, a lot of the teachers are worried about health issues that is indeed deserve to be worried about. Uh, but I think for children, especially young children who are at low risk of uh, you know, uh, being uh, seriously ill from, from, from the virus and their schools are closed, uh, I think the I think the, their primary concern is lonely and boredom, right? So, uh, uh, and my hope is that even if the pandemic's over, uh, children will still be, be lonely and bored sometimes, especially during summer breaks. And uh, literature has shown that summer breaks actually when uh, the SEIS, SE social economic uh, status uh, disparity really uh, diverse and amplify because uh, you no know, low SES kids they're bored and lonely and they but they don't they do not have the opportunity to to do something exciting and learn something new whereas uh, well off uh, the kids from well off families they can. Uh, visit places, uh, see exciting stuff, right? So how do you do if you're just, if you're literally locked in your home, and how can you spend a high quality time by yourself? Uh, and also I, I think this 
the, the story of Newton is education for parents. Uh, the, op, the, 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 the theory of optics is also educational to many parents who maybe ha never had a chance to think about uh, how lights and color travel, right? Uh, so here are the ideas I want to deliver and, and ideas I, I try, I'm trying to avoid. I want to deliver scientifically, scientifically correct text and illustration. Uh, I want to deliver the idea of making a prediction and test it. I want to deliver the idea that we should vary one factor at a time as you test your hypothesis. I want to deliver the idea of reverse thinking, meaning or you will, we want to check our assumptions uh, critically. I want to show evidence. I want to, I want to uh, provide opportunities to develop a number sense, but I do not want to talk about math and formulas. Uh, I, I, want to, I want the book to create a space for open discussion. And I want the book to be relatable. Uh, so I purposefully uh, uh, choose not to portray Newton as a 17th century old white dude, <laughs> right? I, I, I want Newton to be a kid, right? Uh, I, I, want a new, I want Newton to be a contemporary kid. And also I want the book to be uh, emphasizing to, to, to show that Newton was also bored and lonely. Uh, what I want, I want to avoid is everything in the right hand image. This is a cover of, uh, of a picture book actually. I have, I have a copy of this book here. Uh, this, this, uh, can you see how, what, are, what is wrong with this cover? Any volunteer? Or what you don't like about this cover? Well, I think the apple is, you know, the first thing you see, and also the, the hairdo. Where, where's, where's that? The hair. Oh, that the Long hair. hair, kind of looking old fashioned. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's, it's sort of unclear exactly what he's doing there mm -hmm. uh, with his hand. And yeah. there's some sort of colors coming out of that prism, which mm -hmm. are uh, not really very accurate. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then the prism in the upper right, who knows what's going on there? It's like a jumble of colors and prism you know, maybe it's a Pink Floyd cover. <laughs> Pink Floyd, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, and of uh, course, he has his he has his telescope in the background that wasn't <laughs> developed until after this experiment. But, um, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, but he um, did he did working on the he did work on telescope during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, this was yeah yeah, uh, but, but I don't so, think it was. Yeah, uh, I think it was after his color experiments because that's right. how why he why he made a reflecting telescope was he realized that he had said that making telescopes of glass was hopeless because uh the colors would always separate with the glass and you get a fuzzy image oh yeah right um so yeah obviously the apple is there to reinforce the myth <laughs> that i i don't want i don't want a picture book to reinforce myth Right. Secondly, the the rainbow in the air really troubles me because in reality we cannot see a rainbow in the air unless you fill your room with the powders, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and you will you you will get you will easily explode your room if you can fill your room with powders. But but we rarely see such a exaggerated rainbow. So there's a fantasy part in this in this cover mm -hmm. that I don't like. Uh, and also, there's some factual error here. See the position of the prism. It was mm -hmm. positioned wrong, mm -hmm. right? He was, uh, was placing the, the, the prism like this, and the light comes in from, mm. from the triangle side and, and come, comes out from the triangle side. 
<laughs> so just fa the factually it is wrong, and illustration illustratively it is 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 exaggerate is exaggerating, and it is reinforcing some myth, and uh, and also this is a uh, like a uh, seventeen uh, British style, uh, which is which is factual, but but I I prefer not to have right. So I want to avoid the rainbow. I want to avoid the apple. Uh, and I also want to avoid explaining everything. I do not want it to be a textbook, right? I, I, want, I want the book to have the potential to, for an advanced uh, conversation, but I don't want the, 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 the book to explain everything. And I, I want to avoid terminology like like angle, like refraction. I want, these are the terminologies I want to avoid because my target audience, which I haven't mentioned, what, I, I, what I'm imagining is six to 10 years old, right? And, and I'm imagining they're doing this during the summer break uh, with their parents uh, or uh, during, this, during kindergarten and elementary school with their teachers, uh, which will be during the semester. Okay, so here is the book. Please go download it from this link, the scholar.harvard.edu slash Chen Chen. Should be easy to remember. Uh, I can also- Can you throw it uh, in the uh, chat? Yeah, I'm just doing that. Thanks, Chen. Uh, my, how to do that in my, yeah, I guess I'm sharing screen and it's hard to control. Well, I will. Stop share for a moment. Probably paste it to the chat and you can go to the link. All right. Um, I'm going to I'm going to take the uh, I'll take the honor to read my own book for the first time. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to read it for you, and then uh, I'll give you some time to uh, to read it uh, by yourself. Right? If you go go to this uh, web page, you will see uh, a link to download this book. This should be the latest version. Right? Okay. Let's start. Newton in the pandemic. On his way to school, Newton passed by a shop that sells all kinds of glasses. Some pieces of glass are spheres, some were cubes, some were pyramids. Some pieces were, tiny, were shiny, some are transparent, uh, some are colorful. What shape is this? asked Newton, two of the sides are triangles, the other three are rectangles. I call it a prism. I use it to create colorful lights from the sunlight, the owner answers. How is that possible? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. Newton bought a prism from the shop. He loved it so much that he carried it with him every day. Each day when he passed by the glass shop, he asked with himself, I wish I had the time to sit down and find out where the colorful lights come from, but I, have to, but I have so many other things to do. In winter, suddenly, many people in Newton's town got sick. They coughed, ran fever, got chill, um, and felt very tired. Uh, the town's, uh, the town's uh, school closed, a note on the door read, a plague is spreading from person to person. The best way to avoid getting sick is to keep social distance. This sickness will pass. Until then, school is closed. Everyone should stay home. Mm. Newton felt bored staying indoors every day. I miss school, he said to himself. The good news is I finally have the time to sit down and find out where the colorful lights come from. Where should I start? It's a prison 
giving off colorful lights by itself. I can test it in a completely dark room. Newton closed all doors and windows in his room and covered them to keep the lights out. When it was completely dark, he could not see the prison. Newton knew one thing for sure now. The prison did not give off lights on its own. Hmm. The prison needs a light source. I need to make one thin beam of light to go through directly through the prison. But there is light everywhere. How can I create one thin beam of light? Newton shut the curtains on his window in the middle of a sunny day and punched a tiny hole in one curtain so a very thin beam of sunlight shone through. This beam is bright and white. It's not colorful at all, he thought. Newton placed a prism in front of the beam of light. The light went in at one angle and came out at a slightly different angle. A rainbow appeared on the wall opposite, mm. the, opposite the window. White light goes through a prism and becomes colorful. How is it possible? Maybe it is because the hole in the curtain is too small or maybe it's too big. Newton punched different size holes in the curtain. Each beam of light casts a rainbow on the wall after you went through the prism. Maybe this happens because the surface of the prism is flawed. Maybe it's not flat or it has dirt on it, Newton thought. Newton let the beam of light pass through different areas of the prison surface. The rainbow stayed the same. Mm. Maybe it has something to do with the wall. How can I change the wall surface and its distance from the prison? Newton thought. Newton placed a wood board on the wall and saw that the rainbow appear on the board. Now, Newton knew for sure that the surface didn't matter. He moved the board closer to the prison. A rainbow appeared on the board no matter how close the board moved to the prison. Newton knew another thing for sure now, the, dis the distance didn't matter. Maybe it is because the prison adds color to the white, to the white light like a magic. If this is the case, I can put a second piece of prison in front of the rainbow to create even more colorful rainbow. Oh. I wish I had another prison, <laughs> Newton said. What, what will I see if I let through one color from the rainbow and shoot this one color B to the second prism, then to the third prism, then to the fourth prism? Will the beam stay the same color or will it keep adding more colors? So many questions, so few prisms. Up to now, I had only thought about how prism may add colors to white light, as if white were empty of colors. But what if white light, white light is not empty, but mixes all colors? If the colors are already inside the white light, the prism doesn't need to add more colors. All the prism is doing is splitting the color lights, colorful lights from the white light. I can test it out by adding different color beams together. Will it become white? Or will it become even more colorful? I wish I had a second prism. I wish I had many prisms, but the plague is still around and the city is shut down. The school is shut down, glass shop is shut down. You cannot buy another glass, uh, another piece of glass until the plague is gone. Newton waited for days, then weeks and months. Newton waited for the plague to pass. A year passed, it was summer again. People cheered as they heard the good news. Patient pays off, the plague is gone. Stores are open, school will open soon. Newton ran to the glass shop and bought a whole bag of prisms. Newton left through a blue beam from the rainbow and cast a blue beam through the second prison. The light that came out of the second prison stayed blue. It did it again with a red beam, green beam, purple beam, one color in, same color out. You can know for sure now, prison don't add colors to light. Newton moved down 
He used three prisms to cast three rainbows on the wall. He turned the prism to move the rainbows closer, closer to each other. Finally, he combined the red, green, and blue colors at one point on the wall. That spot became white. This proves my guess, Newton was excited. The color white is actually not an empty color. It is a mix of many, many rainbows. The prism does not add colors, it splits colors from the sunlight. School is opening soon. I cannot wait to share my discovery with my classmates. All right, so here ends my story <laughs> and, and ends the picture book. I will give you, you know, uh, about uh, five minutes to read it by yourself, and we'll dis we'll discuss uh, after after our reading. Uh, I will invite Max to talk about his drawing of this cover page, right? So you have five minutes. Congratulations, did you finish your, are you, did you pass? Yeah. Oh, okay.
All right. Uh, uh, let's go on uh, with the rest of the presentation. Uh, I want to invite, uh, I want to first invite uh, Max to uh, share the, the, the painting and the rationale behind this cover page. Uh, it's beautiful cover. I'm really happy with this one. Uh, Max, uh, do you want to talk? Uh, sure, if you want, I, I don't have the uh, image. If you want to put it up, then that'd be great. Oh, but did you, can you see the image? Um, no. Are you seeing the cover? No, no. Oh, nobody see the cover? You have no to problem. share your screen again. No. We can see it when we go on to the book ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I see. So when I was uh, reading it, you, you, you didn't even see it. Well, we did if we had it open. Yeah, I, I, right. we all had the book open. I share screen. Perfect. Um, yeah, so here is the cover page. Um, hi, everybody. So, um, Chen actually came to me to uh, talk about this book, and um, uh, I actually was um, involved in terms of uh, art direction. I didn't really, as you can tell, there's a, hu a huge difference between the interior illustrations and the, the book cover. Um, originally, I was just uh, doing sketches for the, uh, the other artists to be able to construct um, her pages according to Chen's story. Um, but what interested me uh, in this project um, was actually trying to make uh, some kind of artistic, um, how, would I, how should I say, some, some kind of artistic fruition uh, come out of um, the, the, the very strict laws that light um, follows when it's actually being refracted. Um, and so I thought that maybe I could make, create something called Planta Prismatica, um, fancy Latin word for prismatic flowers, um, I, or plants, sorry, prismatic plants, um, or crucial flowers. But then, um, and what happened is I started arranging, uh, uh, I started arranging um, the prisms in a, in a way that they might create circular forms where the light gets trapped uh, uh, circulating between the, the different prisms um, until the light either dissipates completely or is absorbed by the glass or finally finds a way out of uh, uh, the circle that has been caught in between the, the pyramids, uh, sorry, the prisms. Um, I had to drop the idea of crucial flowers because as Chen pointed out, when you start to have all these pyramids and circles, which you can kind of see on the, the cover, they don't really look like flowers, they look more like ferns. Um, uh, as a, uh, so I, I went back to the idea of Planta Prismatica. Um, so uh, when I was drawing this up, I think it presented this idea to Phil uh, a few years ago. Um, I was thinking about uh, buying lots of prisms and actually trying to do this my, myself in a dark room. And then Phil uh, pointed out that, you know, I could just go on to the FET, um, the FET uh, simulator I don't know if you're familiar with the FET simulator, P-H-E-T, where they um, allow you to simulate uh, refraction through different media uh, using different wavelengths of light. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you, Phil, for saving me a lot of money and time and effort for <laughs> buying all those uh, different uh, prisms. Um, and in fact, so on with the simulator, I was able to construct all the correct angles that the light would um, refract with um, when passing through um, prisms. And that's what the, uh, the, the tree is based on. It's based on this idea that the light uh, will you know, hit the glass and refract in all sorts of different directions. Now, there are some fanciful sort of reflections coming off of the tree in all sorts of directions. And um, that's, that's sort of internal reflections and um, deflections that occur when you start to align lots of prisms together. Um, but in general, these, these uh, prisms are sort of set up so that the light will follow a very specific and true scientific path. 
uh, as it, it travels from prison to prison. And um, the idea of the tree came from quite simply, I mean, I've done this a lot in my, in my other art projects is that I love trees because um, they kind of combine, you can combine everything you want to talk about into the tree. And that was um, uh, probably inspired by Darwin's very, very simple diagram in his book, Origin of Species, where he has the, the simple uh, tree-like diagram just, um, describing um, evolution. And, uh, and I, I just like using the tree as a framework for everything I want to, want to talk about or for illustrating ideas. Um, some of the problems we ran up against were, we did a lot of other drawings trying to show that the angles at which the light um, will refract out of a prism, um, uh, it's, it's difficult to illustrate because there's only like a five degree difference in refraction angle between the red light and the violet light. So we had, um, uh, yeah, we, we were doing drawings like this and uh, we realized that uh, the angles just, it just wasn't obvious that the angles were gonna be changing that much, except you'll notice in this drawing, the, the lights, the different color lights, the four different color lights at the bottom stay within the circle of uh, prisms and then head south. Whereas the red light is, the angles change so much that that light actually um, misses the last prism, the sixth prism and heads north. Um, so uh, basically uh, what was interesting, this, this cover is very, very different from what I drew only in the sense that Chen was able to throw it into um, the computer and mess around with the image, uh, transform it a little bit so it could fit the cover. And uh, for me, that's great. I, I always see illustration as a, a sort of like a starting point um, for um, some mutations and, and uh, wider possibilities because I can't see everything that's going on and I can't possibly imagine what people are gonna do with what I've done. And I, I like to give people um, carte blanche to, to, to take what I've done and run with it in any direction they wanna go in. Um, so like I said, I see the illustration as a starting point and not an end point. Um, and I guess lastly, it was kind of a challenging uh, piece of work to do because Light, light is um, inviolate. I mean, you can't um, you can't do what you want with it, really. Um, and Newton discusses this in his original paper because he's saying, "Look, I I was able to extract one color from the the spectrum um, uh, from yeah after the light was refracted. I I took red and tried to do everything I could to get another color out of the color red. And and no matter what Newton did, he couldn't make red become another color." Um, and so it was refreshing, but also kind of frustrating sometimes to realize that, um, you know, I, I couldn't do whatever I wanted with any of the colors. Um, they have their laws unto themselves. Um, I did have a little bit of fanciful, um, uh, a fanciful moment. I had Newton, this Newton at the tree is based on the Newton on the inside of the book. Um, so, you know, you see the signature cap and maybe the straps of the backpack. Um, and of course, the pyramid, the prism is, uh, he's resting his uh, left arm on the prism. I, those colors inside that prism are very fanciful, but I just thought it was pretty. <laughs> and of course, instead of holding a book, this Newton, modern day Newton is holding a, a portable telephone, a cell phone. Um, yeah, that's, that's sort of the genesis of, of the image. Thank you, Max. Uh, yeah, well, uh... Uh, Vivian Zhang, uh, the, the illustrator for the rest of the book, is adopting uh, a Max drawing to, to create a, a cover that will be consistent with the style of the book, but it will take her a while to, to finish that. So, uh, but I think this, this uh, cover is absolutely uh, gorgeous, fabulous. Right? All right, uh, let me. Uh, let me uh, go through some of the noteworthy designs in this book, uh, and then I will open the stage to to for for your feedback. Right. Uh, so first of the design I want to point out is how we deal with uh, the rainbow and or the lack of a rainbow that is that is popular among uh, Newton's uh, among books about Newton. Right on the right hand 
bottom corner was the very first draft of illustration. We see there is a very exaggerated rainbow, very pretty, mm -hmm. very interesting, but not what we want, <laughs> right? Just not what we want. And the direction is wrong. Uh, uh, I think a kid will love it. Teacher may love it, but, but we made a conscious decision that we, we should not include this. The reason is uh, this could be a model, right? This could be a visual model, but this is definitely not what you will observe in the glass shop. So we want to push uh, a, a progression from what you can actually observe, like the left hand, left bottom corner in reality, and what you can summarize as a, as a model in the top right corner that Newton talked about in the classroom, right? So we want to build this, this progression. So we first want to stay with the fact, with the, with the observable fact that you can see in your naked eye. And most of the kids are likely to see with their naked eye is that they can see spots of the, of the spectrum. Uh, it may not be so impressive because you know, if you do the experiment by yourself, the, the, the spectrum usually is, is as big as that, right? And we do not want to show a beam of white light. We want to show a, a, a spot in the, in the curtain and a white spot on the table. We don't want to have a white line that connects these two dots, right? And we do not want a rainbow shoot, shoot the air. So what we, can we do is we have three cats jump in the air that, that try to block the spectrum three times. And you can see that wherever the cats uh, uh, block the spectrum, you will see the spectrum that is aligned in one, in one line, right? And then the next progression is that we want to, we want to connect the lines. It's as if you are connecting, the, you are tracing the trajectory from the prism to, to the end point, right? It's as if you are drawing many lines, but we want to draw the lines uh, for the reader. And, and we want to show that in a, in a uh, physically possible scenario uh, that we are able to see a perceivable uh, difference in the, in the dispersion, right? Uh, we will talk about this graph uh, again in the next few slides. And then the final uh, uh, model is presented by the very end. Right, so I, I do not want to have this Pink Floyd cover in the very beginning of the book as if that we know the answer, as if that we know that the light bend this way and, and become a rainbow. Uh, we, want, we want to keep the puzzle and try to solve it step by step. So I think that's one of the uh, features that we work very hard on it. And Another feature of the book is uh, repetition, iteration, and prediction, right? And Newton uh, mentioned a couple of times that, oh, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe it's too far, maybe it's too big. So, so just tossing, repetitively tossing his uh, guesses and then uh, uh, reject or test uh, all of these hypotheses. And, and, and there is the there is a repetition of oh I wish I had another prison he kind of created for the second and many more prison many times and and another example is uh, imagining the possible scenarios be before he actually do the experiment uh, will it be the same color or will it cat, uh, keep adding more colors uh, so so to, you know it's just encourage the kids to imagine it first. And so that they can test it out and reject at least one of the skin arrows, right? Uh, so uh, another another feature I actually uh, Max talked about. I will go through that briefly. Is to get the science right. That uh, we use a, a simulation, 
of free simulation available online to, to create these flowers, right? And uh, so this is the artistic version and uh, the original version is like this. Um, uh, to make sure that all of these angles are precise, right? Uh, uh, and then we, we actually experimented with uh, uh, multiple colors and we tried to make it artistic and also scientific. Uh, we eventually didn't uh, use this uh, uh, display. I uh, think this might be too complicated because there are cubes in it, there is uh, murals in it, uh, but this is one possibility that we tried. And here with, uh, okay, now we want to make it artistic, but we also want to deliver some of the science idea, which is you want to control as much as possible. We want to fix the input of the light to be parallel. We want to fix the prism to be the same position, same angle. And we want the outgoing light to be non-parallel and go to different trajectories. But the, but the trick is that if you do this illustration, uh, you do this simulation online, the, the outgoing light is nearly parallel because, because in reality, as Max mentioned, uh, it, it, chances is you can only observe a five degree difference. And you, when you spread them like this, they will perceive as parallel, which we do not want, right? We, we do not want to uh, exaggerate in a way that is not truthful, but we also do not want to accidentally deliver the ideas that had <laughs> parallel line in, parallel line out. That would be a dangerous idea that we, we will may, may puzzle the children for, for many years to come. So, uh, so what we do is we find another simulator Right, you can actually change two factors with the prism and to within the physical laws that you can change the prism angle, make it make it wider, and you can change the medium of the prism to 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 have to make it have a high dispersion. Then we can create a uh, a, uh, a dispersion that, that that separate the colors. Uh, immediately, right? And these are all the materials you can choose from. Uh, but I actually do not know which material this is because this simulator just only allow me to, to, to uh, uh, control this, uh, control this uh, uh, dispersion from low to high, but it didn't give me a number, right? So if anybody knows uh, have, or have a guess, please let me know. I would like to have a, put a note in the book so, saying you know, this, this kinds of glass it can, be, can be purchased somewhere. <laughs> um, I, I would say that's, that's yeah. probably diamond. <laughs> so it's you're not going to be able expensive. to purchase that anywhere. <laughs> no, no, if you purchase this book, we, we, can, we can send you a diamond. <laughs> it, it, is, it is sold in one package. <laughs> <laughs> right, but uh, my point is, well, uh, a high, uh, well, is that this graph is possible, right? It's not a fantasy. So I basically copy this graph in Adobe Illustrator and to have this five colors, you can see the, the outgoing lines are not parallel anymore, mm -hmm. especially if you compare the red and the violet. And then I, I connect it to the rest of the flowers, right? So, so this is one of the example of getting the science correct. Also, per Phil's crest yesterday, he said, uh, you cannot have uh, Newton talk about his uh, theory without having Robert Hooke in the classroom. So I put a little note, <laughs> a, a little notebook of Robert Hooke. And if you amplify it, it says ideas that I'm too busy to publish, Robert Hooke. 
But you have to really magnify it. You have to really magnify it. Uh, yeah, there are some historic anecdotes. Uh, but, but it's really, really tiny notes. Uh, all right, so the next step is I want to develop a reader's companion for parents and teachers because there are so many details uh, that we embedded in, in this book that we don't we don't talk about in the, in the narrative. For example, if you look at this classroom setting, every kid is bringing something to present, right? So these are the things that they learned about or they built uh, during the pandemic. So it's not like saying that every kid should learn physics, ever, everyone should follow Newton, everyone should uh, do, do their homework. But, but uh, during the pandemic or when have or anytime we have free time, such as a, a summer vacation, uh, we are not busy with school. You, you, you should finally do something that you have hoping to do. Uh, uh, and what are the things that you, are, you have been hoping to do, but too busy to do? Uh, uh, these, these are the interesting conversations the parents and teachers can discuss with, uh, with their kids. Right, so this is one of the examples. Another example is here the two prison experiment. Actually, there's a crucial experiment that Newton did is to reverse the direction of one of the prison, right, to reverse it. And then white light come in and got refracted to color and then got refracted back to white light. So it becomes a white light in, white light out. So that is a crucial experiment that I did not, I did not introduce into the picture book because I think it's really, really uh, complicated and maybe confusing for young kids without guidance. But my hope is uh, provide this opportunity for teachers and parents uh, as an extended uh, discussion to think, oh, what if we rotate one of the prism? What will we see, right? But that's a very advanced topic. So, so, so I'm trying to create a companion that covers from very basic topics that the uh, adults and kids can, can talk about and to some more complicated topics that may be suitable for, for an older kid, right? Um, so, okay, here is a, big questions that I want to reflect upon. Like, can we teach science ideas to young children without using fantasy? I think most of the picture books on the market and the television shows on, uh, on the market uh, borrow too much fantasy or rely on too much uh, about fantasy, which can bring misconceptions. So can, can we just talk about fact but still make it make the make story interesting, right? And secondly, all models are wrong. Or all illustrations are wrong. Now, how can we illustrate a theory? Uh, or how can we develop a progression to illustrate a theory? The third, uh, can we teach about COVID-19 without washing hands a hundred times? Uh, can we just not focusing on the dirty hands? Can we focus on something else? But that's still relate, that's still relatable uh, for someone who experienced COVID-19, right? And for many parents, Reading a picture book to a child is the only window to learn something new uh, when in, during their busy life or to correct a misconception. Like how can we make a picture books or television shows maybe? Uh, that is uh, nourishing to, to older kids, right? to, to parents. Uh, that the parents can, can learn something interesting, learn something new and can ask some interesting questions or a question that is not like a not like an exam to parents that they will they will in, be intimidated, but a question that is inviting to parents. So they will they will spend maybe five minutes thinking about it. Right? I think that will be a worse time worse of time for the parents, and that will motivate the parents to to spend more time reading with the kids. And I want I, also the, another question is. Uh, I, I think how I'm trying to demonstrate in this picture book is I want to recap recapitulate the, the story of science in this picture book, but not necessarily to repeat 
the original history of science, right? I want, I want the figure in the book to go through some of the milestone thinking process uh, and hypothesis, but not necessarily put him back to a 17th century uh, uh, University of Cambridge, right? And lastly, well, well, this is a question I've been asking myself, is it a dangerous, is it, is it a dangerous idea to learn to be alone? <laughs> uh, a lot of the uh, children's media and books talk about how to be social, how to be a civil, social, how to make friends. What well, these are really, really great ideas, really important ideas. But I haven't seen any picture book talk about how to spend time alone. I think that is a, that is a problem because kids do spend time alone. And, and, uh, and adults do spend time alone, especially during the pandemic. The best thing you can do is to, to keep social distance, spend time by yourself or within your immediate family. Uh, so I'm hoping that a, when a parent reads this book, he or she value the time of being alone and do something that he or she has hoping to do, but too busy to do. And also, I want, I want to, I want children to talk about what their plans about summer vacation. Uh, even if it's just staying at home, uh, they can do something exciting, uh, initiate something they have that's, that has inviting them or puzzling them for a long time, right? But again, uh, uh, is it a bad thing to? to teach about loneliness <laughs> or teach about being, being comfortable with, uh, with yourself. Is that, is that, is that a dangerous thing? Uh, so, so I think uh, uh, Newton is such a unsocial person uh, with a pretty nasty personality, but I think <laughs> his story uh, offers, some, uh, offers some reflection to, to educators about about uh, social emotional learning from from another perspective, not not always about making friends. Uh, but of course, not about making enemy, but uh, be comfortable, <laughs> be comfortable with yourself, <laughs> uh, uh, be calm, and and focus on something that interests you. Right. Uh, well, here ends my uh, talk. I I want to thank. Uh, Max and Vivian Zhang again for their illustration. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Sichen and uh, Laura uh, for helping me uh, well, telling the story and, and uh, correcting some of the typos and the language issues. I think there's still some language issues that I'm going to fix if you spotted any. I think I just spotted a few. Uh, let me know uh, if you spot any. Uh, uh, scientific error, please let me know. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, here ends my talk and I'm just eager to hear about your thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Any comments? Yeah, I have a lot of comments, but I don't want to go first. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go first. I, Jen, I um, really enjoyed this. Thank you so much, Re really, uh, Jen and Max. And it really um, resonates on so many levels. I love all the different layers of mm. um, intentionality you've brought to the story. It's really um really wonderful and it's wonderful to hear you explain those um you don't often get a chance to hear uh, a storybook writer explain all the levels of and I, I just think that's really nice um uh and and uh the story resonated <laughs> resonated with me personally in some ways i mean one of the things that got me interested in science is an experience, an optical experience that was very puzzling to me. 
which was um, hiding in a barn between the door and the wall of the barn and the door had knot holes in it. The wall had knot holes in it and the mm -hmm. white barn door had all these little upside down pictures of the field outside the barn and <laughs> just, so anyway, I, the, the, the picture of the phenomenon, I really appreciated not seeing the projection of the beam because what you've drawn really is what, what you observe if you have a prism hanging in your window in the sunlight, you see these spots appearing mm -hmm. um, on the wall. And so, uh, uh, so I really like that. Um, just one, if, if, if you are still working on the reflection reader or the, you know, the reader to accompany the book, um, one place where there is an observation kids can make that you didn't call attention to is um, with the experiment when, when Newton put a piece of wood and tried different distances and said, well, it, it's not that. Well, but at different distances, you would see the rainbow shrink and grow. Yeah. Which is another piece of evidence for that dispersion because that, you know, as you go further away. So just calling attention to that observable thing um, is not uh, possibly an opportunity. But anyway, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll stop my comments there. I have lots more, but I really, um, thank you. This is really oh, lovely. You. Yeah, I did consider the shrinking it with a distance, but uh, as Max mentioned, that uh, actually the the angle is really, really tiny. Uh, the distance is hard to be perceivable given the small space of Newton's room in the picture book. So we we were like hesitating on how like no, is how that, exactly is that, we wanted is to that is that true? Because I, I don't know. I'm just thinking of the prism in my office at work, which I haven't been to in a year and a right. half. So maybe yeah. I'm recalling it wrong. <laughs> but, but I would always go to the projection of the rainbow across my office right. to see yeah. the most dispersion as opposed to the one that would fall on me next to the window. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I could make the wood board go much closer to the prism and then you will see a very narrow rainbow. Uh, compare it to, to the one on the wall. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I, I can say, Chen, I, I think this is amazing. I, I, the, the word intentionality to actually plan to do these things and and write them down and talk about them is like well beyond the way I work, which is to um, uh, not elucidate these things, but have them sort of all internal. So to actually have these intentions, these goals is great. Um, uh, I, I, this is a great book. I can't wait to read this to my grandchildren. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot of fun. And I have a, a couple of comments that might be useful to you. Um, I really like the development of this dark room laboratory, which Max has talked about a lot. You know, the creation of this perfectly dark room is a kind of laboratory, an unusual situation, you know, a torturing of nature, as it were, um, to exclude everything but the, um, the object and experiment. Um, and that's often so much what scientists do is they concentrate on one variable or one particular phenomena. Um, I think Max's flowers of prisms is really, really great. And it really makes the point without beating kids over the head that the, that the colors, the prism doesn't create the color. It's always the same color. I think that's, that's really cool. Um, the distance issue is an interesting one because um, Newton certainly noticed this and, and, and experimented with distance. As you get really close to the prism, you can't see any colors. So you just get sort of the white light out of the, 
prism. And as you back off, the colors become the 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 spectrum opens up and the colors become more apparent. So the distance is really really important. Um, the 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 spectrum gets bigger the further you go away and dimmer. But if you get really close, you don't see very much. Um, 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 uh, a few other things. Um, uh, I'm wondering what 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 some uh, critics would say about you know the 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 idea that Newton was just a little kid and all this stuff. And I'm I'm reminded of what Alan Lightman did with his book Einstein's Dreams. He just made it a recall. So he said, these are the dreams that Einstein may have had. So in some way, you know, somebody retelling, it's just sort of like, um, you know, uh, Scheherazade in the Thousand and One Arabian Nights. She's telling uh, uh, stories to the Sultan. And so, you know, just a, a little artifice that said, somebody is telling a story or there's a dream or some, some um some way to say this is somebody's recapitulation or creation of the newton story you know erases all of the all of the uh, problems with errors or inconsistencies because it's just somebody's interpretation um i think that's a really cool way to do it um, um a, a couple of opportunities um one is that chandeliers certainly existed at the time, and people noticed the little colored rainbows on the wall of the room when the chandelier was lit up because it had all of these, you know, prisms and other shapes. So that was a common um, experience to see those little rainbows. But also looking at the chandelier, you see very bright colors in the crystals as you move around. And the idea of looking through the prism is probably a good place to start because you get all these blurry images and super bright colors when you look through the prism at any kind of um, specular uh, reflection uh, off of objects. So that's, that's, pro that's probably one of the experiences that Newton had uh, before these experiments, although he doesn't talk about them at all. It's just when you look through the prism, you see all these things. Um, um, uh, not, another is, is a glass of water, that if you put a glass of water in sunlight, you get, you get the chromatic aberration and you get colors on the tabletop that came out of nowhere. There's a glass and there's water, which is clear, and you get all these colors on the tabletop uh, in, in the sunlight. Um, so these, these kinds of um, phenomena presented themselves for a long time. Um, um, I like the addition of Hook to that. I mean, th this is this is in Newton's paper. He actually credits Hook. Uh, after this, he like avoids Hook like the plague, but he actually credits Hook with doing a little experiment with hollow prisms filled with liquids, um, which you know uh, Hook took Hook Hook thought that since he was using prisms. You know, he should get like all the credit for Newton's experiments, but he wasn't doing what Newton did. He just filled the prisms with liquids uh, and, and, and uh, looked at the light that was transmitted through the prism. Um, uh, so I had a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you. Um, what, that was one of the um, big uh, problems I was having with the illustration of the, or like, you know, we're looking at the text of the book with Chen was, to have people appreciate the fact that the light, you know, basically masking all those colors are masquerading as like as white light when they're together, and when they they're going through the air as white light, um, but then they hit something that's denser than air, and I was, and and um, that doesn't seem to come up very much. Like we put the light through the glass, but we're not talking at all about the fact that the glass is a much denser material than the light uh, than the air, and that. Um, that's scattering, refracting uh, the, uh, uh -huh. the white light into colors. And I was just wondering what's a, what's a good way to make people think about, make students think about um, that change in media? 
Yeah, I, I, I don't I, I don't know whether it was so it was sort of under the table, uh, you know, it was ignored in Newton's um, in uh, initially, I think. And it's like, uh, you know, b because glass or water do essentially the same thing when shaped into a, 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 a prism. Um, uh, um, and, and air was not really understood as being, you know, it, it, it really was a result of Boyle's work and, and Hooke's work that air was some sort of a substance and that you could like measure its density and it had properties. And uh, I think it was, it, was, it was heavily ignored before, uh, before um, Boyle and Hook. And Snell, um, I guess, right? Well, well, I, I, yeah, well I, just would have been, I think also, actually I'm so struck by how many people were working on the problem because Snell had, uh, Descartes had written about this 30 years before Newton, and, um, and he got the law of refraction from Snell. Mm -hmm. And I'm struck, I, just to go back to Chen's theme about what do you learn alone and is it dangerous to be alone? I, I love the book because it's so, it, it really simplifies everything, but I was struck by how social uh, process science is. I happen to be reading now about Leibniz's work on optics and mm -hmm. what blows my mind is that Descartes worked on it. We're talking now about both reflection and refraction and Descartes 30 years before Newton's, uh, <laughs> I had to stay home, 30 years before was bouncing t tennis balls literally off a wall to show that the angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. But he, nobody knew what to do about refraction because he couldn't. it wasn't an easy mechanical model of it. Um, but what struck me is that for the next hundred years, every oh, practically every physicist you can name was writing letters to all the other his contemporaries, many of them nasty letters about how refraction really worked. So the 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 I, I, the idea of colors is very different. That's that's sort of separate um, from the idea of what happens when you hit. Uh, what happens when you hit a glass prism and you get reflection of light. So people had the, I mean, even, uh, I forget now who came between Descartes and Newton, who had, um, basically they, they knew that the, the law of refraction was signs and there was a constant in there that had to do with the density of the material. So by the time Newton was doing this, um, that, was, that was known. I mean, that, that was known to his, to his contemporaries. Yeah, yeah, so certainly Snell's law was known as a, as a physical yeah. law, an equation that could predict something, right. yeah. Right. But Just, actually before Newton, about 20 years before Newton, there was a physicist named Marcus Marcy who actually did the same experiment with uh, prisms and um, the, uh, the, with two prisms and finding, uh, uh, that the second prism didn't create any colors. Um, and I, I was, I, it's, it's not very well known. I think it's very interesting because what Newton did with this um, was he made this, these fundamental discoveries and then he applied them to explain other phenomena. It wasn't some isolated thing with glass prisms. It was, he explained where the rainbow came from. That was like everybody saw all the time and nobody had done that previously. And so he, he took his discoveries and then applied them broadly. And that seems to be where the credit usually goes for scientists, not the initial discovery of a phenomena, but using that phenomena to explain um, lots of other things in nature. I'm sure Gerhard has a lot to say about that as well. Um, uh, because uh, uh, just the discovery uh, or the quantification of phenomena is not, um, not enough. Now I was thinking one opportunity for 
for this as an illustration is when you're using that board to move the board with the spectrum, I mean, one thing you could do is you could put a knot hole in the board because Newton figured out he was cutting out pieces of cardboard to let um, different colors pass in the spectrum. So he was letting some through the board and then experimenting after the board. And that's, you know, that would probably be a nice little piece of the story that he could isolate the red by just arranging the board with the knot hole in the right place. Um, uh, and then I think he used some colored glass. Uh, he, pr he may have used mirrors to combine uh, different parts of the spectrum back together. Like that final picture you have, the classic one with the circle and all the, um, the, the what is that? The, the, the cat with the red, green, and blue circles and the white in the middle. That's not something that he did. Um, and that's sort of a modern representation of color mixing. Um, but he did recombine everything together. Um, uh, that is something that he did. And he, he talked about how colors are produced, uh, how different colors are produced in the spectrum. And of course, he famously named the colors in the spectrum. And um, uh, he was fascinated that there were seven, or sort of forced it to be seven colors so he could compare them to the seven notes in the musical scale. Um, uh, but the, there's, there's, um, there's lots of places to go with this. This is really quite amazing. Although I think the glass of water is an early start, sort of like Mary talking about the holes in the barn, in the, in the, in the barn door or wall. It's like, what is, what, you know, this is weird. I didn't expect that. I just expected a spot. Just like if you have a glass of water in the sunlight, you just expect white light coming through on and being on the table. Instead, you get some colors. Where in the world did those colors come from? Yeah, thank you for the suggestion. I would definitely add a glass of water, at least a place on the table so people can discuss about it. Uh, and the slit uh, on the board is a good idea. And for the RGB circles, uh, I, that's where I want to show a reverse prism and convert mm -hmm. it back to white. But I have so much trouble thinking how to explain it to a kid without, posit without confusing them at the near, <laughs> near the end sure. of the book yeah. uh, uh, because the book doesn't really teach about refraction. So yeah. the, refract, the idea of refraction is never explained in this book. So how can color bend backwards and become white? I think that's really confusing. Yeah. So actually the RGB circles is like a replacement of that idea as a converging colors back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah when, one thing in Newton's article, when, when he was using that board and changing the distance, he originally thought that the light was moving in a curved path. So he was trying to see what the curvature of the light beams was. And there was no curvature. They were just all going in straight lines. And he was surprised at that. So, um, so he, he clearly didn't think about what Snell, uh, what Snell's law shows, which is essentially that it's all straight lines. He had some other idea that he was working with, which he disproved to himself. All right. Well, um, it's twelve fifteen. Um, mm -hmm. Chen, I'm. I will save. You have some nice comments in the chat. I will save that mm -hmm. to send to Chen so he can look yeah, at that. Um, but feel free to email Chen with any of your further ideas, reflections. Um, yes, please do. I'm. A, I'm a frequently updating it. Uh, so uh, maybe in a couple of days, if you go to the, the link, you, down, you can download the new version after uh, that, fix the typos and maybe add a glass of water or somewhere at the table. Yeah. Great. And, and, and Chen, I wanted to thank Chen um, 
for for a great year being the director of the seminar. He's done a great job, and I really appreciate all his help, and um, really made it exciting. So thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I'm going to take my second shot vaccine this afternoon. So <laughs> time to take a break. <laughs> <laughs>